All right, good morning. How are y'all doing? Awesome. Um, well, if you have your Bible, uh, you can open it up to Mark chapter 8. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, but you want to uh, maybe follow along in the scripture journals, we do have some of these available for you. Uh, and if you don't have one, but you want one, it's a great place to like take notes, follow along, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we do have someone coming around. If you just raise your hand, uh, they'll bring you one of those, and uh, and you can uh, grab one. Uh, so uh, and then also, if you are uh, just trying to maybe you forgot your Bible, uh, or maybe you're new to church and haven't navigated through the Bible a whole lot, there are some blue Bibles down in front of you, and you can turn to page 820 there, and uh, and that will be a spot. Oh, where you can find us in Mark chapter 8 today. Uh, we're going to uh, glance back at a few verses that Brian actually talked, with, talked about last week, dealt with a little bit last week, mainly because in verse 31 of chapter 8, uh, there's this reference uh, that I think is really important to understanding uh, the passage that we're going to deal with today. And then if you're just jumping in with us and you haven't been here, we've been in the book of Mark for in and out for about a year now. Uh, so there's some 18 or so messages that you can go watch online or listen to online to catch up if you're just catching up with us. Uh, but let me just give you a little snippet of where we've gone in the last couple of weeks to get you to where we are in chapter 8, okay? So chapter 8, the book really shifts in, like the, the book of Mark really makes a shift, and it's really what I would consider the beginning of the end. It's a focus of where Jesus' ministry is going from the people to his disciples and, and preparing them for his impending death, uh, which was discussed a little bit last week, uh, and we'll discuss in more detail today. However, uh, we also discovered last week the reason why he had to make this shift from this, his ministry being to the people, to his disciples, is because like the blind man that we saw last week, the disciples just consistently missed it. Although they, they could see some vision of Jesus as the Messiah, he wasn't clear to them. Like who he really was wasn't clear to them. And so... Uh, they and us often have to put on a new set of lenses in order to see Jesus as he really is. And, um, and mainly uh, because the way in which Jesus is going to go about defeating evil and dealing with um, the enemy is completely backwards and upside down to the way often uh, we and his disciples think that that should and can best be uh, taken care of. So, with that, we're in verse 31, and, uh, and we'll start uh, here. It says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man... Now, if you're reading along uh, with us, gr grab a, a pencil or a pen or something, underline Son of Man, circle Son of Man... Make sure you make a note of Son of Man. It says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. Now, now here's the thing. Okay, we're going to come back to this idea of Son of Man uh, in a little bit. Uh, Jesus is going to make another reference to the Son of Man toward the end of this passage, and, uh, which is why I wanted to start here in verse 31. So just make sure you hold on to that, and, and we'll come back to it. But Jesus says, like, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again in three days. And, and Mark says he said it plainly. Now, the reason why Mark makes it clear that he said this plainly is because a lot of things that Jesus says aren't very clear. Right? Like, up until this point, like, Jesus used a lot of hyperbolic language. He's used a lot of imagery. He's used a lot of parables and riddles. He even used a riddle earlier in chapter 8 when talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And so he's speaking very clearly and very plainly and very explicitly, and he says, guys, I'm going to die. And I'm going to rise again in three days. Really simple and really plain. But as we saw last week, Peter takes issue with this. Look at this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
But turning and seeing the disciples, he, Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. Now, <laughs> Peter, gotta love him, is like, all right, well, I guess I gotta be the guy. Uh, and so he... <laughs> He pulls Jesus aside, you know, kind of like, you know, I pull my son aside when he needs to be talked to. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and he pulls Jesus aside. He's like, hey, uh, Jesus, um, I just want you to know you're not. You're not going to die. You're, this is not, this isn't God's plan. I don't know. We still believe in you, but like says it's the thing, you know. Uh, and it, it says Jesus, I love, I love this. It says Jesus looked at the other disciples. It's as if like, Peter and Jesus are having a conversation kind of over in the corner of the room, and then he looks over at the other disciples to see how they're reacting and how they're responding. And then he rebukes Peter. Now, it's interesting because the, the word that's used here that says Peter rebuked Jesus is the same word Jesus gives back to Peter. But the interesting thing is it tells us what Jesus actually said to Peter. It says that he said, get behind me, Satan. So you can infer based on just the usage of that language that Peter is almost telling Jesus that he's in opposition to the plan of God, that he's in opposition to the will of God. Because anything that comes against or stands in opposition to God's way or his will is satanic. And that's what Jesus is trying to communicate. And that's something we should also pay really close attention to in our own selves and in our own lives. You know, Brian mentioned it last week, and we might mention it a lot more as we get closer to the first week of November. But as politically polarizing as our world is right now, we have to truly ask ourselves if, if we... If we are thinking long and hard enough, if our minds are set on the things of God or if they're set on the things of man, we have to stop and we have to pause and we have to truly reflect where are we? And are we standing in opposition to the things of God because we desire the things of man? This is real stuff and like Peter if you and I if we, if we take a, a stance let's say a strong stance and, and that stance happens to be against the will and desires of God for his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven I, I want you to know that same rebuke that Peter received from Jesus we will receive ourselves that same rebuke that says, hey, you don't understand the vision that God has here. Like, your kingdom vision is different than God's kingdom vision here. And if that's where you're at, then just know you're standing in opposition to the king of the kingdom himself. And when you do that, you're on the wrong side and you're in the enemy camp. Be very careful. That your heart and your mind are set on the things of God and not the things of man. But then Jesus continues in verse 34, and it says this, And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, so Jesus calls the crowd to him. He's been with the disciples. He calls the crowd. There's a crowd uh, nearby. He calls them to him, which is a, a sign that, like, Jesus is uh, essentially uh, inferring that if these guys who have spent the last couple years with me um, and have spent every day with me for the last couple years, if they don't get it, then likely you don't get it either, crowd. Then likely you're missing something, too. And then he says something, some of the most famous words we ever hear from the mouth of Jesus. I mean, if you grew up in church, you've heard these words uttered so many times, it's unbelievable. 
right? That if you want to be my disciple, if you want to come after me, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. Now, before we just pass by that uh, verse, because it's something that we all know and we've all heard a lot if we've grown up in church, uh, and, we can, and we can think like, oh yeah, man, it's just, there, there are just some crosses that we have to bear in life. Don't, let's not use it that way. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Like, whatever difficult situation you're going through, trying to follow Jesus through the midst of that difficult situation is not your cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is talking about. And we don't, uh, or I wouldn't encourage you to use it in that way. I, I would encourage you to, 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 to put on the eyes of those that Jesus is speaking to because to the people that he's speaking to, this meant something very, very different than just going through something difficult and still trying to follow Jesus in the midst of it. Uh, in order to show you what the, 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 the people uh, that Jesus was speaking to uh, were thinking, I want to I just take you back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 21, there were obviously going to be some Jews in this crowd following Jesus. And this is what Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22 through 23 say. It says, if, anyone, if someone guilty of, capital, uh, of a capital offense is put to death and his body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it the same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. Other translations might say a tree, if you're hung on a tree, which we know the cross is a pole. The cross is this tree. And so for, for the Jews standing in Jesus' audience, as he says, if you want to come after me, here's what you have to do. You have to pick up your tree. You have to pick up your pole, and you have to be willing to carry it, and you have to be willing to die on that tree pole which everyone would have thought in their mind if they were jewish in that time they would have gone you want me to be cursed by god to be killed on a pole to be hung on a tree and murdered like you want me to be cursed by that's a cursed man's death not a righteous man's death And then you also have to couple that with those Gentiles who were in the audience listening to Jesus. For them, the cross was a spectacle. Right? The Roman Empire would, would line the outer rim of all the cities in which they conquered with crosses. And they would hang failed revolutionaries on those crosses as a sign to say, hey, you want to come against the empire? This is what happens to you. This is how they kept the Roman peace. Right? Pax Romana partly was, was possible because they made a spectacle of anyone who tried to come against the Roman Empire. And so Jesus is speaking to this crowd, and if you're standing in the crowd, what you're hearing is, you want me to be cursed by God, or you want me to be a part of a failed revolution? <laughs> Does that sound like a good idea to anybody else in the room? Like, if you're standing in that crowd, you're probably like a lot of these people going, no, nah, bro, that's not it. You know? Like, that's, that's where you're at. And man, but Jesus is really, he's really doing something significant here. He even doubles down in verse 35. He says, for whoever would save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So this picture, in these couple verses, is a picture of God's upside-down kingdom. It's a picture of how his ways are just vastly different than most of our ways. And the way in which you win, Jesus says, the way in which you win is not through a forceful revolution. It's by taking the foolish life of Jesus and making it your own. That's how you win in this life. 
That's how you win in this world. It's not through forceful revolution, but it's through taking on the foolish life of Jesus. Why do I say foolish? Well, because no one in that crowd and and most of us today think that living life the way Jesus lived life is actually foolish. Like by the way in which most of us live our life, we actually say, man, Jesus, your way is actually, I, I, don't, I don't like it a whole lot. I'm not, I'm not signing up for that a whole lot. Because we believe in power, and we believe in authority, and we believe in, in having uh, responsibility, and we believe in, in numbers, and we believe all, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. My way is very different than that way. My way is not about any of those things. And we see his way of life as foolish, whether we want to admit it or not. By the way we live our life, we admit that we see his way as foolish. The way in which we live shows what we actually believe. Our behavior always reveals our true belief. And we might believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins. <laughs> and that he, that he took the cross and didn't fight back. And told one of his disciples when he drew a sword, put it back. And we might think, wow, Jesus, I'm so glad you did that for me. If someone comes for you, are you going to put the sword down? That's the way of Jesus. That's the life of Jesus. And we think it's foolish. Look at Revelation chapter 12 with me for a second. Revelation chapter 12, uh, there's a scene where uh, the, Satan and his angels are hurled down to the earth and they're uh, destroyed and beaten by God and his angels in heaven. It's this beautiful, if you're a guy, you should read the book of Revelation. You'll love it. Uh, and, 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 uh, but it's just like this massive battle scene and the enemy is defeated. But look at verse uh, 10 uh, and 11 where their song breaks out. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death notice two things real quick about this first how do they overcome and how do they win? How do they triumph? It's by the blood of the lamb. It's by Jesus dying on the cross and, and sacrificing himself in order to defeat evil and win. It's through the cross. And then it says, and, and this is a big and. Do not miss this and. And when I talk about this and, I'm not saying that and you earn your salvation here. Okay, that's not what this is saying. The grace of Jesus through your faith is what saves you. But what is the word of the testimony? It is the way in which you live your life. They overcame and they triumphed by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. It is the way in which we live our life that actually reveals whether our faith is genuine or not. And so the word of their testimony was that they did not consider life to be so much as to shrink from death. They picked up their cross and they followed Jesus to the very end. Not just through a difficult situation and through difficult circumstance, but through life in such a way that it led to their death. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. For the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. I live my life by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
And this is all foolishness. This is all foolishness. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. He's saying to those who are going to hell, those who are dying and are being condemned, those who, who are, have not found their way to be with God, those people, to them, the cross was a foolish thing to live by. It was a foolish way of life. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are saved, it is the power of God. It's the actual power of God, the cross. The way of the cross is actually the power in which helps us triumph and overcome what it is that we are, are, are needing to overcome, the evil and injustice and, 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 and just sheer hatred of the enemy. It's through the power of the cross. He says, if for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Guys, the cross yes, is about something that is Jesus did in order to save us, but it's also a symbol of the life and the ethic in which we are called to live. It is a way that Jesus provides us with salvation, but it's also the way he lived his life and the ethic we are called to live our lives by. For Jesus, the cross is a way that provides salvation, but it's also our testimony. It's our story. And as foolish as it sounds, that's the way you will triumph here on earth and bring heaven here on earth. It's by laying it down. By giving it all up. Triumph will not be won by more power or civil authority. It will not be won through violent revolution. It will be won by Christians who give up their rights, who give up their humanity, who give up their desires, who give up their visions of grandeur, who give up their lives to love the hurting, lost, vulnerable, and broken people in our world. That is how victory is won. That's the way of the cross. To forsake that way, to forsake the way of the cross, we'll lose everything we're trying to hold on to so tightly. That's what Jesus said. The life that you're striving to hold on, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it trying to hold on to it. If we're too proud, if we're too ashamed, if we're too scared, he's going to have an issue with that. Our faith will not be genuine enough. Look at what he says next in verse 38. He says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father and the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now let me try my best to wrap this up and, um, and make sense of this. So it's, it's pretty simple. Jesus says in this sin, sinful generation, this, this idea is in, in this age, right? Um, in, in this day and time, in this day and age is what Jesus is trying to get at. When he says that, he says, if you're going to reject me now, you're going to reject my way of life, you're going to reject that I'm going to take the cross, 
that I'm going to die and that I'm going to rise and this is the way I'm going to achieve victory. If you don't believe that and you're not willing to do that with me and live that life with me and go there with me, he goes, then you deny me now. I'm going to deny you. I'm going to deny you when I go into glory. And... You know, a lot of us, we think that this means like when Jesus comes again, like the second coming. We think that that's what this is, is pointing at, but I don't think that that's what this is actually pointing at. Because Jesus says in, in chapter 9, verse 1, he says, I, I, truly I say to you, some of you are going to see this take place. Some of you are actually going to see this happen. Like, you're not going to taste death until you see the kingdom of God come in power. The kingdom of God is going to come in power. And you're going to see it. So what is he talking about? Well, he uses this terminology, the son of man. And he says, when the son of man comes in glory. Right? He talks about coming in glory. And the only other time that we hear about this idea of the son of man coming is in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the word Son of Man is mentioned, and it's the only time in the Old Testament that it's about the Son of Man is mentioned with the word coming. And it says, it says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into His presence. Is, is, where, where, who is the Ancient of Days? Who is the Ancient of Days? God, right? Yahweh. Yahweh, God. He is the Ancient of Days. And where does God live? God lives in where? Heaven? Okay, so the Son of Man, is, is the Son of Man leaving heaven and coming to earth, or is the Son of Man leaving earth and going to heaven? The Son of Man is going to heaven. And it says when he gets there, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people in every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting, dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Hear, hear, me, hear me when I say this. When Jesus died, and when Jesus rose from the dead, and when Jesus looked at his disciples in Matthew 28, and he said, all authority has been given to me now. The kingdom had come in power. They got to witness the kingdom of God coming in power through his death and through his resurrection. And he says, all authority is given to me. Now I want you to go make disciples. What does it mean to be a disciple? Well, it's what we talked about today. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them what it means to give up their life. To lay down their life and pick up their cross and follow me. That's what I want. Don't teach them how to come to church services on Sunday morning. That's not what Jesus said. Don't, don't teach them just how to know the Bible. Teach them how to live it out. And more specifically, how to live out this sacrificial way of life where you're going to give it all up for the kingdom. Give it all up for God. And if someone comes to take your life, give it to them. Because that's the, that's the, that's all they can take. They can't take your salvation. They can't take your hope. They can't take the peace that comes only through Christ. And do you notice that it's, he says, go do this in Judea and Samaria, the ends of the earth, every nation. And who is, who is he? He now has the authority, sovereign power, all nations and people in every language are worshiping him. What do we see in Revelation? Every knee is bowed, every tongue from all nations, every, every like human that you can imagine from every place around the globe that you could imagine is, is there. John talks about in Revelation how there's a multitude that he can't count. 
That was, that was John's way of saying, well, we kind of all th- only thought that the Jews were going to be here. But now, look, I can't, even, I can't even count all of these people. I don't know what tribe they're from. But they're here, and they're worshiping. He's one. He's one. The question is, do we believe in that so much? that we would not consider our lives so great that we would shrink away from death. See, the question we have to ask ourselves, church, is if if he's reigning, and he is, and his kingdom is now and forevermore, the question we have to ask ourselves is do we believe in Jesus enough to follow him, not it through difficult things? And I understand, man, there are lots of difficult things. There's financial crises, and there's family crises, and there's, there's, there's diagnoses that come your way. And man, like, I, like, yeah, man, I hope we have enough faith to stay with God and, and walk with him through those things. But that's not your cross to bear. Your cross to bear is actually like giving up your life that his kingdom might come here on earth as it is in heaven. And most of us live as if that's foolishness. And we need to really truly ask ourselves, is that what we believe? Do we believe it would be foolish to give it all up? For him and his kingdom or are we willing to say you know what call me foolish call me crazy I don't care because I'm gonna live my life the way Jesus lived his life and I'm gonna give it up for anybody and everybody I'm not gonna try and save my life but I'm going to lay it down freely. Not just for those that I love, but for those who hate me. For those that want to see me dead. For those that want to ridicule me. For those who have different opinions than me. For those who vote differently than me. For those who look different than me. I'm going to give it all up. You know, I was just thinking about this earlier, and we were singing that song, Firm Foundation, which is a song I absolutely love. I love that song so much. And that comes out of the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, tells a story about building your house on a rock or building your house on sand. And, um, and here's, a, here's the only maybe thing that like, I, I like, struggle with when I, when I sing that song, is that... Um, when we talk about building our life on Jesus, Jesus actually says uh, what you're building on uh, is you're, you're actually practicing. He says those who put into practice the words that I just said in this sermon. When you put into practice what I just taught you, that's what it looks like to build your life on the foundation of Jesus and his teaching. And do you know what he says in that sermon? He says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And blessed are the pure in heart. And blessed are those who mourn. And blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are the persecuted. And he says, you. You must be salt and light. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. He says, you've heard it said. (laughs) Do not commit adultery, but I tell you, don't even look at someone with lust in your heart. You've heard it said. Don't lie. I say to you, just let your yes be yes, and your no be no. You've 
You've heard it said. Hate your enemies. But I say love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. You've heard it said. That the road to life is wide. And everybody's going to be there. He says, no, no, no. The road to real life is actually narrow and only few are going to find it. Let us build our life on the way of Jesus, on his teachings. Put those kinds of things into practice. And I guess what? When it's all said and done, you will have triumphed because of the blood of the lamb in which you put your faith in and you lived out and the word of your testimony. Amen. Let's go.